first first week we kind of gave a kind of a general introduction to the book, what the book was about, who it's about, who it's addressed to. Then over the last two weeks we looked at just some references in the book, uh, how, how you want to understand the book of, of Revelation is to go back and find the Old Testament references. But this morning we're going to begin our overview of the book. And I don't know how long it's going to take for me to do this overview or exactly how much detail I'm going to get into. Just take it as it goes, Billy, man. I don't know how much detail I'm going to give you or all that. All I know, all I know is this, is I'm really tired of being misused in the book of Revelation. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's, it's one of those books just like... Uh, just like Hebrews and, and Matthew and Acts and all these other books that men misuse to teach doctrine that, that, that'll get you messed up today. Amen. I'll be the first one to tell you there ain't nobody in the book of Revelation secure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey Amen. There's no security. Romans 8. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Doesn't apply in the 70th week of Daniel. Right. No, no. You know what Jude said? Jude's writing in the seven, about the seventieth week. You know what he says? He says, "Keep yourselves in the love of God." Yeah. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. It wasn't none of this. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God yeah. in Christ. He said, "Keep yourselves yeah. in the love of God." Mm. I don't care. Listen, I don't care how you cut that, slice it up. It ain't the same. <laughs> somebody who cannot be separated from the love of God and somebody who has to keep themselves in the love of God is two separate Amen. things. Right, right. But you know what? The religious world loves Israel's program. Because yeah. mm -hmm. they love the works-based salvation. Yeah. They love the conditions. Sure. You know, Baptists, Baptists are the world's worst for getting up and saying, oh, we're saved by grace through faith, but then... They tell you salvation is the easiest thing you're ever going to do, but then for the next 20 years, all they want to do is get up and make you doubt whether you got it or not. Yeah, yeah. Come up here and get saved. And then the next 20 years, keep coming up here. It'll take one time. Yeah. Hey, man. Yeah. I've heard all these stories. Oh, you, you know, this woman been in church 25 years, you know, and just come to the realization she's lost. What in the world's been going on in a church where somebody can sit in it for 25 years and not know if they're saved or not? Yeah, you're right. Amen. That's pitiful. Truth of the matter is, the woman's probably been saved for 25 years, but the preacher behind the pulpit don't know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And got her so jacked up in the head and so messed up, she don't know up from down. Yeah. That's why Paul said, I fear. Lest as by any means, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, so your minds also shall be corrupted uh, 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 from the simplicity that is in Christ. Yeah, you're right. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which we have not preached, you might well bear with it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Then he comes down there and talks about the ministers of righteousness and all that. Yeah. So I'm tired of people misusing the book. There's people getting their names blotted out. Yeah. There's people who have to keep their garments. There are those who are spewed out of the mouth of Christ. There are those who, who have him show up and fight against them with the sword of his mouth. He comes on them as a thief. What did Paul say about us? You are not of the dark. You are not of the darkness nor the night. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Yeah. He cannot come on us as a thief right. in the night. Why? We're of the day. If he comes as a thief in the night and you're in the day, he cannot come on you as a thief. Right. You're not of the darkness anymore. <laughs> you're of the day. Remember when God divided the light from the darkness and the light he called day and the darkness he called night? Well, you're part of the light now. You're part of the day. Yeah. You're no longer in the darkness. And the thief comes as a thief in the night. <laughs> and so that event has nothing to do with you. That's why Paul said he had no need that he write about those things to us. Mm -hmm. But now real quickly, let me give you a pretty basic outline of the book. Revelation chapter 1 is, uh, well, of course it's the opening chapter. You know? But uh, you have, first off, you have the introduction to the book. It's right there in the first three verses. And if you want to know what the book is and what it's about, John tells you in the first three verses. Mm -hmm. Amen. Then you have the address. The address of the book. It runs down there from verse 4. Uh, 1, 4 down to verse uh, 9 or 10. Yeah, verse, actually it's verse 11. Now from 
this point on, the, three, the book of Revelation has three divisions to it. Okay? One of them's massive, one of them's, two of them are very little, and three, the third one is pretty massive. Alright? Look down there in verse 19. What, did John, what is John told to write? I've seen. The things which he has seen. So that's, that's the first thing. This is the three divisions of the book of Revelation. What he saw is from Revelation 1.12 down to the end of the chapter. What is it? Verse 20? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, verse 20. That's what he saw. Now, what else is he told to write? Things, things which are, that's Revelation 2.1, down to 3, is it 21? <coughs> Let me get this my book, just keep it up real quick. 3.22, it's the seven churches. Now what he saw is Christ in the midst, with the seven stars with the, in the midst of the golden candlesticks, seven candlesticks, and seven stars in his hand. All right? And then from chapter 2, ver uh, 1, 3 to 22, is Christ's message to those seven churches and the seven angels of those seven churches. Okay? Look at Revelation 1, 4. John 2, who? Seven churches. Okay. That's who it's addressed to. Their identity is important. If you want to know what the book, who the book's to, then you're going to have to figure out who the seven churches are. I mean, we'll, we'll cover all this as we get to it, but here you have the seven churches, and Christ tells all of them, remember, he's in their midst now, and he says, I know thy works. And some of the things he commends them for, some of the things he condemns them for, but five of those seven churches are told to repent. Or else. It's not a message of grace. This is a message of I know your works and you better get right or else. Okay? Ephesus is warned that their candlestick will be removed. Uh, Pergamos is warned that he will fight against them with the sword of his mouth. Thyatira is warned that they'll be cast into great tribulation. Sardis is warned that they will be blotted out of the book. Laodicea is warned that they'll be spewed out of his mouth. You think that's the body of Christ? There's no way. Alright, and then the third division of Revelation, this is the big one, is the things which shall be hereafter. And it runs from 4-1 all the way up to 22-21 rest of the book. It has three main parts to it. It has the 70th week. Which ends, which, which brings you up to the second coming of Christ. Then you have the thousand year kingdom. And then you go out to eternity in chapter 21 and chapter 22. Now that's, that's the book of Revelation in a nutshell. That's the easy part. <laughs> Now, now the difficult part comes. And that's understanding the details of the book. And now the majority of this section here, the majority of this section the hereafter deals with that. The majority of the book of Revelation details the events of the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? It runs from Revelation 4 all the way out to Revelation 19. Or in, in the chapter, really chapter 16. And then some details are given and uh, after that and then the second coming of Christ. But, but understand that the majority of the book deals with the 70th week of Daniel. Alright? Now, the chronology of the book is, is something that you can read Larkin. Larkin. Larkin's got a great commentary on Revelation. I won't take anything from him. He's wrong on a lot of stuff, but he's got a good commentary on it. His charts and some of his stuff. Ruckman's commentary on Revelation got some good stuff in it, but he's, Bollinger's probably got the best commentary on Revelation that there is. If you can stomach him trans making his own translation there, it's, it's a pretty good commentary. But 
None of them, I believe, have it right. And I'm not saying that I have it right. There's a lot that I still don't understand about. But I know some things that, that a lot of, I've seen some things that you don't see in a lot of, in a lot of uh, commentaries. When you get into the 70th week there, John's called up, and the first events that he sees is there's a little book in the hand of God that's sealed with seven seals, sealed, written within and without, and sealed with seven seals, and Christ takes that book, he's found worthy to open that book, mm -hmm. and he begins to crack the seals on that book, and every time he cracks a seal, John's told, come and see. Okay? Now those seals, so those, you have seven seals there, running from running into chapter six, but I want you to look at six twelve, Revelation six twelve. Look at that sixth seal. This helps you get the chronology of the book right, because here's here's the general here's the general uh, way the book of Revelation is divided up in seventieth week. They say this is the tribulation, and the last three and a half years is the great tribulation. Right? Nowhere in the Bible are you told the great tribulation is the last three and a half years of, of, of the 70th week. Nowhere. Christ says when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, then let them which be in Judah... For then shall be great tribulation. Not the great tribulation. He says, for then shall be great tribulation. And then he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall. Isn't that what happens at the sixth seal? Okay? So the sixth seal takes you out. It has to be beyond this point right here. You say, why? Because I can read. So the six seals run from here out, and the six seal is open somewhere after the, th after the halfway point. I'm not going to put it on there. I don't know if it's out here, Bill, or out here. The Bible's not specific. What I know is it's after the tribulation of those days. When the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stands in the holy place. Now look in uh, look in Joel chapter two. Well, come to Matthew twenty four. Let's look at that chapter. Now you talk about a misused chapter. I've been here in Matthew every every time there's an earthquake. I the preachers get up and preach on Matthew twenty four. This is it. You know, <laughs> famine and pestilence. You know. You realize three quarters of the earth lives in famine? Yeah. Mm. Amen, Bill. I mean, that, Americans are so full of it, ain't they? That's right. You got half the you got the whole continent of Africa over there starving to death. Yeah. Right. You got people in China starving, people in North Korea digging into trash and getting a, just a little bit of rice to live on. The majority of the world lives in famine. Pestilences? America's just spoiled. Amen. You say, listen, Christ does not talk. You can't make that chapter about nations and Gentiles because it don't work. They've all, there's been famine. All that Christ said, when you see all these things, these things are the beginning of sorrows. Who's he talking to? Amen. Look at what they asked him, Matthew 24 and 3. This, this chapter is specific. Tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That's the sign John gives in 1 John to know that they're in the last time. Yeah. For there shall be many antichrists. Israel's about to go through a very deceptive time. There's about to rise... Antichrist and false Christ after false Christ in the land of Israel, and out and at one point in time, the Antichrist is going to rise. That Antichrist. Mm -hmm. But they're all going to have one thing in common. They're all going to say Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. Yeah. That's how John says you're going to know him. Mm -hmm. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, but is that spirit of Antichrist. 
John tells them that in 1 John chapter 4. But he says, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then, you see that? I love that. Then. Man, I mean, God, God gave us such an easy book to follow, didn't he? And look, look, at, look at verse 10. And then. Then come down to verse 15. When? Now what did they ask him? They had asked him, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Well, guess what? It wasn't wars and rumors of wars. He said these are the beginning of sorrows. But the end is not yet. Something has to happen. Look at the one thing he tells them to look for. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Now look at, look at that there in parentheses. I love that, man. That's God giving a little extra side note to somebody that that's, wants it. He said, whoso readeth, let him understand. Mm. Christ knows that these words, isn't that strange that Christ knew these words were going to be in a book one day? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Matthew pinned that down there and all this, but look. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountain. I don't have a red letter Bible up here, so I'm not even sure he said that. But the point is, 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 is it's important. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them, then, you see it again? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Matthew 24 is about us according to everybody except dispensationalists. And for whatever reason, God decided not to give us specific instructions for this time. Bill? He didn't say, let them which be in, let my, let my people which be scattered throughout the world. He said, let them which be in Judea. It's a specific instruction for specific people. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why? Verse 21, for then shall be what? Great tribulation. So that right here, this event, we know when the abomination of desolation setteth up, it's in the midst of the week. We can go back to Daniel and read that. Okay? And so when he sets up, then shall be great tribulation. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, let me erase that because now that's getting, it's going to confuse you. Immediately, so there's a there's a period of days here beginning at this point but in those days for this shall be great tribulation and immediately after the tribulation of those days. So there's a, set, there's a period of time after the halfway point that there's great tribulation. We know what it is. It's in Revelation 12. There's a woman over there uh, in travail and pain to be delivered. That is, that is the tribulation of, the, of, of Zion and Jerusalem. Okay? That's why it's let them which be in where? In Judea flee. Mm. Now when he, the, 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 the dragon sends out a flood after this woman, she flees out to the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. Man, we've got some scripture on that, man. Mm. Isaiah 41 and all this. But she goes out to the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God to feed her there. 1260 days and that dragon sends out a flood but the, but the earth opens up her mouth and swallows that flood and so he goes to make war with who? The remnant of her seed. That's, that's Israel that's still scattered among the nations. He goes to make war with them and the Bible said he overcomes them. Yeah. For 42 months power is given unto him. Now, at some point, Christ is going to open this sixth seal out here. And when he does, it is immediately after the tribulation of those days. And look at Joel chapter 2. You say, why did God write the Bible like that? I get asked that all the time. Why did God make it so hard to understand? Remember when Jesus said he hid, he said, I thank thee, O Father, for thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. But have to reveal them on the base. Yeah. God gave you a book that if you don't care, you ain't going to find it. And I just mean that. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Don't think the Bible's going to yield anything to you if you don't care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen? 
Look at Job chapter 2, verse 31. Well, verse 30, he says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Christ says this in Luke 21. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. So, see what God did there. He gave you an event out here in Revelation with this sixth seal that shows signs in the heavens of the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood, the stars being cast down to the earth and all that. And he states about this sixth seal in two different places that it's immediately after the tribulation and before the great terrible day of the Lord come. There's your chronology. Okay? This helps you, listen, I'm not showing you the absolute chronology yet, but what I'm showing you is how you get the book of Revelation lined up. You can stare at chapter 4 through 19 till you're blue in the face and not get the chronology of Revelation. That book is a sealed book, man. Mm. Yeah. Christ unsealed it and gave it to John, but the only way blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. The only way you're going to hear the prophecy of Revelation is to go back and hear the prophets. Yeah. And so you've got this sixth seal now. When, when he opens that sixth seal, it's clear what happens. And so this introduces us into a period here, which you're going to see there in Revelation chapter 7. Prior to the opening of the seventh seal, there's a period in which the 144,000 are sealed. John sees a great multitude that came out of great tribulation. That great multitude that come out of what? Great tribulation. What's over? Tribulation's over. Mm. Remember, remember John saw in the fifth seal the souls of them that were beheaded under the altar and they said, How long mm. dost thou not avenge our blood? And he says, Rest a little what? Season. Mm. Until the others who are to be killed like you are fulfilled. So when you come into Revelation 7, that great multitude that come out of great tribulation is the complete number of them that are, be, are to be martyred. And now the time has come for God to avenge their blood. That's why when, when the seventh seal is open, there's silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And John sees one of those seven angels come and he grabs coals from off the altar and he takes a censer, and that censer is filled with the prayers of the saints. And he takes that and puts them coals in there. And that smell of the prayers of the saints are offered up in the presence of God. And then that angel takes it and casts it to the earth. You can find a similar scenario to this in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 9, there are men sealed in their foreheads. And then, got, then six men go through the city and destroy everybody that's not sealed. And in chapter 10, one of the cherubim come and take coals from, from off the altar and sprinkle the ashes over the city. Mm. And so this is the references, man. Listen, I'm not proclaiming I understand it all. But I'm telling you, I understand more than they do at the sword of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Amen? You get out here, you got this seventh chapter. It's a break. Something else is getting ready to come. What's getting ready to come? The great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's introduced with seven trumpets. The day of the Lord, the actual day of the Lord does not come till the seventh trumpet is sounded. But you have these seven trumpets now. All right, the seven trumpets run. Uh, they're all blown there from Revelation chapter 8. All the way up into chapter 11 where the seventh trumpet sounds. But, but God throws you for a loop here. <laughs> Bill, I've read this, read this, try to figure this stuff out, and I've about lost my mind in doing so. But God throws you for a loop in chapter 10. What he does in chapter 10, if you're going to get the chronology right. The seven trumpets sound up through here announcing the coming day of the Lord, which is still future. Let me 
grace is. The day the Lord is still out here and you've got you've got one, two, all the way up to the to the six trumpet sounds there in Revelation chapter nine, and then something happens in chapter ten. Look at it. And I saw another angel uh, coming down, come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as a were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little what? Is that what what happened? What what is it? What's the description of that book? It's open. Now John was told to or Daniel was told to close a book. He said, close it and seal it. Mm -hmm. It is for the time of the end. We're going to look at these verses, but this angel comes down and has a little book open. And he cried with a loud voice, verse 3, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Mm -hmm. Kind of wish John would have kept it to himself. <laughs> Don't know why he decided to tell us that he heard something he wasn't allowed to write because all it's done is spark my interest now. Mm. I'd rather just not put it in the book, Corn. <laughs> but, but it's a waste of time to try to figure it out. Amen. And the angel which I saw standing, unless somebody has figured it out, and I'm all ears. Mm. But the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Get Daniel 12 now. I'm going to compare these scriptures. Daniel chapter 12. Bill, I love Holy Spirit filled Bible study. You know, yeah. you start reading verses like this, and the Spirit of God starts saying, "Remember this over here. Remember that over here." The way God, the way the Spirit of God talks to you is through this book. Amen. You know, and the Spirit of God is is always going to lead you. He's going, he, listen, God wants us to understand the scriptures. I understand that. And the Spirit of God has come uh, 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 and he, he, he abides in us and, and He takes the way He teaches us the Bibles with the Bible. He, he leads you comparing scripture with scripture. Okay, the angel which I saw, Revelation 10, 5 said, stay, the, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer cold. Mm -hmm. now we'll come back to verse 7 in a second. Look at what Daniel says. Daniel 12 and verse number 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the rivers, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Now get this now. What do you think, what do you think that angel coming down to Revelation 10 is signifying? When, when that, when that, when in Daniel he asked, when, what shall be the end of these things? When shall, how long shall these things be? Or what, how long shall it be to the end of these things? And he's told for a time, time, dividing of time. Or three and a half years, or 1260 days, 40 and two months. Now that angel in Revelation comes down and says, what shall be no longer? Time. So what do you think that angel was telling him? What has what time has now ended? That 1260 days. Now look at verse, let's look at Revelation. Keep your place in Daniel because it's all important. Revelation 12 or 10 7 now. Look at it. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So when that seventh trumpet begins to sound, it's the beginning of a, a period of time that you might get some of the answers in Daniel 12. I don't know. Because God mentions 1,290 days and 1,335 days over there. Now, I don't, I don't know how long these days are going to last. 
But at the end of the 1260 days, you cannot assume the second coming of Christ because Christ said no man knows the day nor the hour. Yeah. Okay? The 1260 days marks the end of, of what's been determined upon God's people in the holy city. The days of the seventh angel are a period of time after the 1260 days, when that seventh angel begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Verse 8 says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. So now John, John at the end of, at the period Dealing with the end of this period, John is told to take a book and eat it. Mm. It's now open. Come back to Daniel 12. Daniel, there's another question asked there in verse 8. In verse 8, he says, I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Not how long, what shall be the end? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till when? Now, what did John get out here? Now, Daniel's told an angel, uh, uh, a man clothed in linen lifts up his hands and says, This will be for a time, time, and dividing of times. And he's told, he, he then asks, What shall be the end of these things? He says, Go thy way, Daniel, close up the book, and it's sealed for the time of the end. Now that book had, was unsealed back here, wasn't it? Wasn't it unsealed? Mm -hmm. And then that book is sent down to John at the end of this period and he eats that book and he's told he must now prophesy again. Okay? You got that? Come in Revelation chapter 11. Because the seventh trumpet still ain't sounded until you get into Revelation 11. But God throws you for another loop here. <laughs> you got to get this stuff figured out, man. You're going, the book of Revelation is never going to make sense. What, who were the 70 weeks determined upon, folks? Thy people and thy holy city. Look at Revelation 11. Look at verse, uh, look down at the end of verse 2. And the what? Holy city shall be trodden, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So Revelation 11 is about the holy city in the last three and a half years, or the last forty and two months. Okay? Look at Revelation 12. There's that woman. That's, that's, that's Daniel's people. Some play into the wilderness. Somebody's called up to the throne of God. Some people flee into the wilderness. Some, some are overcome by the Antichrist. But who, who's that chapter about? It's about Daniel's people in the last 1260 days, time, time, dividing of times. Mm -hmm. Look at Revelation 13. Look at verse 5. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue how long? Those three chapters, Revelation 11, 12, and 13, are all about the 1260 days. John is now getting details about that period that wasn't given in the first part of the book of Revelation. The book's now been opened. He's get, it's given to Daniel. Daniel eats it, he begins, or John, and he begins to prophesy again. And he takes him through. Now watch this. He shows him Jerusalem, the woman, and the beast in the last 42 months. But look there in Revelation 11. This is where God throws you for a loop again. You've got you to pick up on these little things like this. Verse 15, and the seventh angel what? Sounded. Now look at the description. What is the seventh angel? What did the seventh angel bring in? The mystery of God should be finished. Okay? Now look at the description of this. 
and the temple of God. Look at verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. You see that? Mm -hmm. That happens when the seventh angel sounds. Now come over to Revelation 16. I know this lesson, man. I'm, I'm just as confused as you are, and I've studied it. <laughs> but you got to get this. The seventh angel does not sound until... The 1260 days are over out here. Okay? That period is now over. Time shall be no longer, he said. Out here. If I can find a marker that works. 1260 days out here. That marks the end of this period here. Now, John is given this book, and he goes back and he sees events about this period here. He backtracks. You got to get that. Revelation 11 shows you the holy city during that period. It shows you the woman during that period. And it shows you the, the dragon and the beast in that period. But at the end of Revelation 11, 15, you have the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And the temple of God is open in heaven. Look in Revelation 15 and 8. Or 15 and 5. After that I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now what, back in Revelation 11 what was there? Well there was thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake and great hail. Right? Look in Revelation 16, 9, uh, 16, 18. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. Look at verse 21. And there fell upon men a great what? Yeah. Hell out of heaven. So the seventh trumpet in Revelation 11 is actually showing you events that are going to take place at the seventh trumpet. But they're given in more detail further into the book. You've got to understand this stuff because it's the only thing that will help you make sense of the book of Revelation. And I'm going to tie all this together eventually, I promise. So you have, you have Revelation 11, 12, and 13 are prophecies concerning the final 42 months. Okay? But out here, after the 42 months, the seventh trumpet is going to sound. And this is called the days of the voice of the seventh angel. So it's not, it's not over yet. Okay? Revelation 14. Very confusing chapter. The what Revelation 14, just like... Just like Revelation 7 was an interlude between the 6th and the 7th seal, where you had the 144,000 sealed, you had the great multitude, Revelation 14 is, is like this little interlude in which God is going to show you the chronological events of the things that's going to take place in the days of the 7th trumpet. Okay? 144,000. Where were they in Revelation 7? still on the earth and they were sealed. Where are they at in Revelation 14? They're before the throne. Mm -hmm. They're with the Lamb in Mount Zion. Okay? And they're, before, they're singing before the throne. They're singing before the throne and before the beast and before the 24 elders. Where are they at? They're up there. Okay? So at some point that 144,000 is called up to the throne of God. Okay? Then, then he shows him, the, then it says, there's an angel flies through the midst of heaven saying, uh, uh, give glory to God and honor to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And, and, and uh, let me read it there. Fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. 
Now Babylon doesn't come into the remembrance of God until after the sixth vial is poured out. <coughs> after the seventh vial is poured out, actually. And so what, what, is, what is God doing in Revelation 14? He's showing you events that are going to happen out here after the 70th week of Daniel is over. You understand that? I hope you do. Okay, look at the third, the third angel. Followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, when does that show up? Here. In this period. And any man that worship the beast and his image and shall receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. When is that wine of wrath poured out without mixture? It's these seven vials up here. So any man that receives the mark in his hand or forehead in this period is going to drink of that unadulterated wrath of God when the seventh angel sounds and those seven angels come forth and start pouring out the vials of God's wrath. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last event that's going to take place is the harvest. The gathering. Now remember Christ said he was going to gather his wheat to his garner. Remember the, remember the parable of the wheats and tares? He's going to gather the tares first and, and, and burn them in bundles and, and the wheat shall be gathered into the kingdom. The parable of the wheats and tares, you can read about it in Matthew chapter 3. You can go back into the Old Testament prophets. They're all, all this stuff's there. But there's two harvests there. There's a harvest that's gathered and then another harvest is gathered and cast into the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. That second harvest you see in Revelation 16 when those three, eight, those three unclean spirits come out of the mouth and the beast and the false prophet and go to gather the armies of the world to the battle of the great day of God. Mm -hmm. When those armies are gathered down there into the, into the battle of the great day of God, God's going to tell His Son, go tread them under your feet. And the blood, the Bible says the blood runs up to the horse's bridle for the space of, I think it's about 250 miles. Yeah. That's a lot of blood and guts, man. Mm. Mm. Amen? The lonely meet Jesus, you know. <laughs> that old roaring lion's going to come back and make a mess. Yeah. Look at, uh, okay, so the seven vials. That's the third part. It's out here. Now, I do not know the time. I know Daniel was told 1260 days, but then he's also told from this period here shall be 1290 days. Mm -hmm. And he's specifically asking what shall be the end of these things. These things are the 1260 days. The end of these things would be out here. And John, Daniel's told about 1290 days. And blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335th day. That's 75 days after the end of the 70th week. Mm -hmm. Bill, I'm just as confused as you are. <laughs> I've studied this stuff for years, man. Racked my brain just laying in bed at night. God, what does that mean? What does that mean? God's given me a little bit of understanding of it, but I, I want you to just, this is the chronology of the book. The seven vials take place after the 1260 days. All right? Then after the final vial is pulled out, you have the judgment of the whore of Babylon. Yeah. All these people, you've got people constantly trying to tell you, listen, when God says Babylon, I believe it's Babylon until, until it shows up and it's not Babylon. Yeah, right. Amen? Yeah. I believe Rome is one of her daughters. I believe Islam is one of her daughters. I believe all the false religions of this world except Bible-believing Christianity. Bible believers are the only ones in this world that's not a descendant, the daughter of that whore of Revelation yeah. 17. Amen. That whore began in Genesis chapter 11 and she's still here today. There you go. Mm -hmm. But at some point in time, all the kings of the earth and all the world has drunk the wine of her fornication. Yeah. And at some point in time, God is going to pour out his, his wrath upon that great city that reigneth over the kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. I'm not somebody that's going to stand up here and tell you I know who it is. I believe it, it's, it's Babylon until, until the day that God says it wasn't Babylon. It was a type and a shadow. That's my opinion. Amen. It may be the Vatican. 
It may be New York. It may be London. I don't know and I don't care. I know God's going to judge a whore in Revelation 17 and 18. Yeah. All right? And that, he, it, that, that woman there, just like the bride or the wife of the Lamb, this woman also is a great city that reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now the way I see it, if they're going to start rebuilding Babylon, they better get the move on. <laughs> Amen? They're running out of time. <laughs> but if you remember back in Genesis, they said, let us build us a city. And a tower. It doesn't have to be completed. They just got to set out to do it. Y'all remember that story? Yeah. 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 Alright, now, last of all, I'm done. Pick up next week in chapter 1. Revelation 19, you have the second coming of Christ for the marriage of the Lamb. The second coming of Christ happens out here somewhere after the seven vials are poured out. And the, the you know that he cannot come back until, I believe it's the, uh, is it the fifth vial or the, I believe it's the sixth vial. Uh, the sixth, yeah, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So it's the sixth vial, the Euphrates river is dried up, and it makes way for the kings of the east to come into that land. Christ is not going to come back till those armies are gathered. Okay? And then in Revelation, uh, after God judges Babylon, they begin to sing in heaven, uh, Hallelujah, Lord God omnipotent and reigneth. He hath judged the whore and the smoke of her torment ascended up forever and ever. And then they said, let us be glad and rejoice. Notice the, the destruction of the woman of Revelation 17 18 has something to do with the coming of the marriage of the Lamb. Amen. Let us be glad and rejoice for the marriage of the Lamb has come, for his wife hath made herself ready. And then Revelation 19 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He that set upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Man, I can't wait. Mm. Honest to goodness, I can't wait. You say, what are we going to be doing? I don't care. It ain't about me, it's about him. <laughs> what, I, what I know is that man's worthy. Amen. Yeah. He's more worthy than Trump, President Xi, and, and, and Boris Johnson over there in the UK, and uh, Angela Merkel, and, and all that. He's more worthy than all of them. I love that verse over there in the Song of Solomon where it says, O daughters of Zion, go forth and see the crown which, his, which the mother of Solomon gave him in the day of his espousals. <laughs> Amen. You know what I'm talking about? When he comes on his head are many crowns. Yeah. That's the day of his espousals, Bill. He gets, he, listen, King of kings, Lord of lords. Mm. He gets it. God gave it to him and he comes and the first thing he does is judge and make war. He understands something that mankind don't get today. You ain't going to make the world a better place by being tolerant and catering and all this other stuff. You make the world a better place by judging it and making war in righteousness. Mm -hmm. The scepter of his kingdom is a right scepter. He has loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God loveth him. Yeah. That's God's idea of a king. Somebody that hates wickedness and judges righteously. Yeah. Chapter 20, you have the end of the thousand years. Satan is loosed for a short time. And then Revelation 21 and 22 takes you out to eternity. Mm. Now, Larkin's got some strange beliefs on that. He says that God said he would keep covenant with them that fear him unto a thousand generations. So Larkin's got this thing that after the thousand years, you're going to have a period out there of 33,000 years. It's God keeping the covenant for a thousand generations, and he takes it. He said a generation's 33 years, and, and then he takes it out there 33,000 years. I don't believe any of that. I believe when you get out, I believe when you get to that new heaven and new earth right there, you're out in eternity. Mm -hmm. Everything has been subdued. Christ has perfected heaven and earth and delivered it back to its rightful owner, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Yeah. Amen. So next week we'll pick up chapter one. That's strong meat, isn't it, Bill? That's, that's a bit to chew on. But next week we'll pick up in chapter one and start looking at, at the book. And I, I, I hope not to get in too much detail. I really don't. And uh, we'll, 
go we'll go through the book like I'm going to I'm just going to spend next week in chapter one. I'm not going to go through a lot of details. We'll look at like two or three things in chapter one. Then we'll look at a couple of things, chapter two and three, and just we'll try to speed through as quick as we can. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another day of life. God, I just, I just thank you for, I thank you, Father, for the cross of Jesus Christ. Getting more precious to me every day, Lord. To be a, a member of, of the body of your son, God. What a mm. what a blessing. What a Amen. what a what a thank. I'm just so thankful for that, Lord. Mm. Paul said in giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. Mm. God, I just thank you for making me accepted in your son. Making me everything that I wasn't in your son, as Paul said, that you've made him unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. I thank you, Father, for my completion in Christ. God, I thank you for this old King James Bible, Lord, and the things that you've taught me out of it through the years, Father, and I just I stand in awe of the things that I've not yet seen in it. As David said, open mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Father, I pray that you continue to open my eyes, Lord, to see the great truths of your word. I pray, Father God, that you, you would help me to be able to teach this church, Lord. And I pray, Father God, that this church would be, would be an outreach, Lord, to the world. Father, I know that this world is lost and confused in religion and, and men perverting and mishandling the word of God. Father, I pray, God, that you would just make this church a light in this community and out to all the world, Father, through our YouTube ministry and everything. Pray for Carly and Corin, Father, as they get getting their start in life, Lord. I pray that uh, that Corin's job would be what you want him to have, Father, and that you would bless him in it, Lord, and, and just bless their life, Father. We pray for Jack that's going to be moving here soon, God. We pray that you, your will would be done there, and, and we pray for our upcoming meetings with David, Father. We just pray that you bless us. We pray for Doris and Kenny and Marlene, Father, and all the other uh, ones that, that are sick and couldn't be with us today, Lord. I pray that you be with them. I ask now that you keep us safe, bring us back Wednesday night safely, and we ask it all in Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen. Amen.